There are ways that you can also measure the spring constant in a dynamic way, which is actually very interesting. Um, I have here a spring, and this spring, this is x equals zero, and I attach now to the spring a mass, m. This has to be on a frictionless surface, and you will see when I extend it over a distance x that you get your force, your spring force, that drives it back. We have, of course, gravity, mg, and we have the normal force from the surface. So there is, in the, in the y direction, there is no acceleration, so I don't have to worry about the forces in the y direction at all. If I let this thing oscillate, I, let, I release it, it will start to oscillate about this point back and forth. Then, as I will show you now, you will find that the period of oscillation, the time for one whole oscillation, is 2 pi times the square root of the mass m divided by the spring constant k. I will derive that. You will see that shortly. In other words, if you measured the period and you knew the mass, then you can calculate k. Alternatively, if you knew k and you measure the period, you can calculate the mass, even in the absence of gravity. I don't use gravity here. So a spring always allows you to measure uh, a mass, even in the absence of gravity. The period that you see, the time that it takes for this object to oscillate once back and forth, is completely independent of how far I move it out, which is very non-intuitive, but you will see that that comes out of the derivation. There is no dependence on how far I move it out. So whether I oscillate it like this, or whether I oscillate it like this, as long as Hooke's law holds, you will see that the period is independent of what we call that amplitude. So I'm going to derive the situation now for an ideal case. Ideal case means Hooke's law must hold. There is no friction, and the spring itself has negligible mass compared to this one. Let's call it a massless spring. So now I'm going to write down Newton's second law, ma, which is all in the x direction, equals minus kx. a is the second derivative of position, for which I will write x double dot, mx double dot. One dot is the first derivative, that's the velocity. Two dots is the acceleration, plus kx equals zero, I divide by m, and I get x double dot plus k over m times x equals zero. And this is arguably the most important equation in all of physics. It's a differential equation. Some of you may already have solved differential equations. The outcome of this, you will see, is very simple. x is, of course, changing in some way as a function of time. And when you have the correct solution for x as a function of time, and you substitute that back into that differential equation, that equation will have to be satisfied. What would a solution be to this differential equation? I'm going to make you see this oscillation first. I'm going to make you see x as a function. And I'm going to do that in the following way. I have here a spray paint can which is suspended between two springs. And I can oscillate it vertically, which is your x direction, like that. So x changes with time. The time axis I will introduce by pulling on this string. When the spray paint is going to spray, I'm going to pull on that string. And if I can do that at a constant speed, then you get horizontally a time axis, and of course vertically uh, vert vertically, you will get the position of x. So I want you to just see qualitatively what kind of a weird curve x as a function of time is, which then will have to satisfy that differential equation. All right, it's always a messy experiment because the paint is dripping, but I will try to get the spray paint going. There we go. Okay, now I'll pull. All right. Could you give me a hand? Yeah, could you please? I'll cut it here, and then you... 
be very careful because it's, it is messy. Or let's put it, let it take it out this way. Okay, just walk back. Just walk. Yeah, great. Yeah, hold up the top so that you can see it. Fine. Okay. What, is, what does it remind you of? Sinusoids. It reminds me of a cosinusoid, by the way. Sinusoid or a cosine? Same thing. All right. Well, let's try to substitute in that equation a sinusoid or a cosine solution. Whichever one you prefer makes no difference. So I'm going to substitute in this equation, and this is my trial function, that x as a function of time is a constant a. I will get back to that in a minute. Times cosine omega t plus phi. This a we call the amplitude. Notice the cosine function is the highest value is plus 1 and the lowest value is minus 1. So the amplitude indicates that is the farthest displacement from 0 on this side would be plus a and on this side would be minus a. So that's in meters. This omega we call the angular frequency. Don't confuse it with angular velocity. We call it angular frequency and the units are the same. The units are in radians per second. The same as angular velocity. If I advance this time little t, if I advance that by 2 pi divided by omega, if I advance this time by 2 pi divided by omega, then this angle here increases by 2 pi radians, which is 360 degrees, and so that's the time that it takes for the oscillation to repeat itself. So this is the period of the oscillation, and that is in seconds. And you can determine, if you want to, you can define the frequency of the oscillations, which is 1 over t, which we express always in terms of hertz. And then here we have what we call the phase angle, and I will return to that, that's in radians. And this trial function, I'm going to substitute now into this equation. So the first thing I have to do, I have to find what the second derivative is of x as a function of time. Well, that's my function. I have here first the first derivative, x dot. That becomes minus a omega. I get an omega out because there's a time here. And now I have to take the derivative of the function itself. So I get the sine of omega t plus phi. Of course, I could have started off here with the sine curve. I hope you realize that. I just picked the cosine one. x double dot. Now I get another omega out. So I get minus a omega squared. The derivative of the sine is the cosine. Cosine omega t plus phi. And that is also minus omega squared times x. Because notice I have a cosine omega t plus phi, which itself is x. So now I'm ready to substitute this result into that differential equation. This must always hold for any value of x, for any moment in time, and therefore the only way that this can work is if omega square is k over m. So omega square must be k over m. And therefore, we now have the solution to this problem. So we have omega equals the square root of k over m, and the period is 2 pi times the square root of m over k. And what is uh, striking, really remarkable, that this is independent of the amplitude, and it's also independent of this angle phi, this phase angle. What is this business of this phase angle? It's a peculiar thing that we have there. Well, you can think about the physics, actually. When I start this oscillation, I have a choice of two things. I can start it off at a certain position, which I can choose. I can give it a certain displacement from zero and simply let it go. But I can also, when I let it go, give it a certain velocity. That's my choice. So I have two choices, where I let it go and what velocity I give it. And that is reflected in my solution 
Namely, that ultimately in the solution, I get the result of A and the result of phi, which doesn't determine the period, but it results from what we call my initial conditions. And I want to do an example whereby you see how A and phi immediately follow from the initial conditions. So in this example, I release the object at x equals 0, at t equals 0. So I release it at the equilibrium. At that moment in time, I give it a velocity which is minus 3 meters per second. My units are always in MKS units. The spring constant k equals 10 newtons per meters, and the mass of the object is 0.1 kilogram. And now I can ask you, what now is x as a function of time, including the amplitude a, including the phase angle phi? Well, let's first calculate omega. That is the square root of k over m. That would be 10 radians per second. The period t, which is 2 pi divided by omega, would be roughly 6.28 seconds. And the frequency f would be about 0.16 hertz. So just to get some numbers. 1.6 hertz, sorry. Uh, this is not my day. This is 0.628, and this is 1.6 hertz. 2 pi divided by omega, you can see this is 10. 6 divided by 10 is about 0.6. All right, so now I know that at t equals 0, x equals 0. So I see my solution right there, right here. I put in t equals 0, and I know that x is 0. So I get 0 equals a times the cosine of phi. Well, a is not 0. If I release that thing at equilibrium and I give it a velocity of 3 meters per second, it's going to oscillate. So a is not 0. So the only solution is that cosine phi is 0, and so that leaves me with phi is pi over 2, or pi is 3 pi. Phi is 3 pi over 2. That's the only two possibilities. Now I go to my next initial condition, that the velocity is minus 3. Now here you see the equation for the velocity. This is minus 3 at t equals 0. So minus 3 equals minus a, and a is we don't know yet, <laughs> minus a, and there we have omega squared, omega, sorry, which is 10. t is 0, I get the sine of phi. If I pick pi over 2, then the sine of phi is 1, and so you find immediately that a equals plus 0.3. And so the solution now, which includes now phi and a, is that x equals plus 0.3 times the cosine of omega, which is 10t, plus pi over 2. So you see that the initial conditions, what the conditions are at t equals 0, they determine my a, and they determine my phase angle. If you had chosen this as the phase angle, 3 pi over 2, that would have been fine. You would have found a minus sign here, and that's exactly the same. So you would have found nothing different.